<laughs> hey, Sam, you're on quick. just playing bass so my fingers are not used to the strings the skinny strings doesn't take long play bass for half an hour and I'm like how do I play guitar again I've got so much music to record <laughs> it's just all printed up laying out here uh, and uh, so Bruce suggest I, I just didn't have time this weekend to get to a, a, a to do all the the work um, of creating the the uh, tab or music notation. I just been working pretty much nonstop all week, all, all last week and this weekend, and even today we've got people coming over. So <laughs> gotta try to kind of get some work done in between hot dogs or something. <laughs> so, yeah, no, busy, busy is good. Busy is good. I uh, started working for a new composer, uh, kind of via another composer, on some stuff. So uh, hopefully that's going well. I don't know. He's he hasn't. Uh, I've sent him a bunch of stuff. He hasn't said anything yet. So we'll see. But every composer works differently. You know, when you're freelance, you kind of have to learn how to work a lot of different ways. And uh, you know, even to the point where people like want different types of files like oh I want AIF files and I want WAV files and I prefer these kind of files and, or uh, make sure everything starts at zero or make sure everything starts at one and so kind of have to remember all that I, I don't really make notes of it um, I just seem to remember it but um, some people you know they want they don't want my plugins they want the, like if I use a microphone they just want the microphone and that's it and they'll add the reverb and the chorus and not chorus but compression and EQ and all that themselves so <laughs> but Bruce suggested maybe we do a um, an ask me anything um, I'm trying to come up with a sound for this solo thing that's not my typical solo sound um, but I, yeah, I figured there's not going to be a lot of people on today anyway, even though people have the day off. Um, I don't know. Let me see what else I got here. not bad but I gotta I gotta add some like delay or something to it Fingers are not warmed up. I'll do my warm up exercise here. One that everybody hates. That might be the hardest one. Almost. You definitely feel it. It's good. It feels good. Hey, Paul Meyer. Hey, Josh. What's going on? Yeah, I didn't put Happy Memorial Day. As soon as I typed it, I was like, no, you don't say Happy Memorial Day. That's, yeah, no, just Memorial Day Monday. It's, it's Memorial Day! <laughs> Exclamation mark. Uh, I, I was just trying to think if I have any relatives that died in 
battle or war, and I personally don't think I have any. I have my dad was in the in the army. My mom was happy that I was blind in one eye because that made me 4F, so I couldn't be drafted. Because when I was born, we still had the draft. We had the draft until, well, what, the end of Vietnam, they got rid of the draft. I, You know, everybody still has to register for selective service. But, hey, Bruce. So I called it uh, Ask Me Anything, I think. So so if anybody's got any questions. And like I said, what I'd like to do is 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 if you guys can... Think of questions, and they could be goofy questions. I don't care. It doesn't matter. They don't have to be really like, oh, do you prefer Gibson or, or Fenders, you know, if it isn't obvious already. <clears throat> but um, the, uh, just, you know, it can be any question so that the first 10 to 20 minutes of uh, of the, the mystery song, as we're guessing the song, uh, can be somewhat useful for anybody, you know, watching. Your draft lottery was 82. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Um, so I, yeah, like I never got a lot. Does that, does that mean that, that you start at one and they go up from there? And so if your draft lottery number was like 582, it wouldn't be so bad. You would be like, oh, I'm safe. But 82, you're like, uh-oh. Is that is that what the 82 means? Oh, what am I looking at while I'm sitting? Um, I, ca I cannot see, I, I cannot ID lurkers, no. Um, I, just those who posted the chat. Um, I might be able to. I just don't know. I don't have that. You know, there may be a link here. Participants. That's just chat participants because I only see one, two, three, eight people here and it says 15 people watching. So that uh, pop out chat toggle tam time steps. That's my only options. So, yeah, that's what. Wow, your great uncle served in World War a doughboy. Wow. Oh, and the American Legion had already posted a flag. That's amazing. <laughs> That's just amazing. Okay, so Bob, you got draft notice right after getting married. And that was a low number, so I I got the draft notice. Dang. Hey, Diane, good to see you. In America, it's, it's Memorial Day, where we remember people that... Um, uh, served, but also died in, in battle, defending our nation, uh, defending freedom. And I think also police officers and police, you know, anybody who served in any of the five branches of uh, the military, and I think police officers too. You don't want to add too many groups of people to, to, to the day because then it waters down. So do I have spare $100 bills? Uh, not today. <laughs> Not usually, although I noticed that my bank machine does offer $100 bills now. It used to be just 20s right now. Now it's fives, 20s, and hundreds. The fives come in handy. So I, I do often, if I go to the bank machine, I'll often get like four 20s and four fives is usually what I get. Um, oh, your yours was, let's see, 3422, birth date and alphabet of last name. Oh, interesting. Oh, Susu, how's it going? God's will, good to see you. Where are you located? And TBT2 USA, ask any question. Hmm, why don't I find a YouTube t for John Gorka songs? Hmm, John Gorka. I mean, you're trying to think of who John Gorka is. Let me look him up. John Gorka. Gorka with a K? Okay. Well, doing tickets. American folk musician. Uh, sorry. You know, it's so hard to keep up on all the music. I'm sure he's amazing. Uh, Rutgers football. What? <laughs> that's on his... Oh, no, that's sorry. That's not his website. Past shows. Time to... Okay. Okay, let me look. Okay, so he's an older guy. He's, he looks... He could be younger than me. No, he's a little older than me. American folk music in 91 called him the preeminent male singer songwriter that's been dubbed the new folk music. Um, who did he did he write for somebody? Nancy Griff, Griffith, who's great. Uh, Jack Hardy. So I recognize some of these names. Sean Goldman, who, okay, Susan Vega, he's appeared with artists. That doesn't mean anything. One of the things, I'll have to check him out now that I've heard his name. 
I actually, he sounds familiar. I think I probably have heard his name at some point. Um, but that's a good question. You know, and if you know his songs, here's a, here's the thing, TBT. Um, I have kind of, now maybe I will do a John Gorka song, okay? <laughs> so I have a, two of my biggest trends in um, my YouTube career. One was doing open tunings. That was a request. And one was doing um, tips for older beginners. So I've kind of learned to some degree that if one person is requesting it, that is not just one person. They represent a lot of people. So I could very well, if I did a John Gork, I picked his most popular song, whatever that is. I don't know. You can go, I go to YouTube, I can go to Spotify, and I can see what his most popular song is. I can figure it out. I can teach it. And... We, you know, go from there. Now, I'm not sure what, if he's finger style. It might be very complex. Um, it might not be worth my time. I mean, when I do these videos, um, you know, typically the only the only money I'm making is the super chat stuff. The guys, you, you know, the, typically I'll make anywhere from a dollar to two dollars for the video. So that means uh, from YouTube. So that means all that work I do sitting over there in my chair in the corner with my laptop and creating the the finale files, you know, the tab and everything that that goes unrewarded for the most part, uh, but but for the generosity of of all of you folks. So, um, but the um, but that it's it's not you know it, oftentimes when somebody asks me now I've had people ask me to do videos. Um, if, in fact, the top ten video to, uh, top ten scale video was requested here in the chat. Um, so, you know, I'll write John Gorka down here. Let me just write John Gorka and try to remember this. Of course, this piece of paper will be on the floor in about a minute. <laughs> so hopefully my brain will remember. Well, did I leave that window open? I did not. Okay, okay. I'll leave the window open here. And he's probably already moved on. <laughs> I don't know if TBT is still there, but uh, I'll, I'll just kind of, I'll minimize this and just have it there so I can go, oh yeah, that guy. Well, let me look, let me check him out. It may be really easy stuff. So, um, John Lemon, John, John Lemon, be, be, be by cold, what, huh? <laughs> uh, yes, Bob, thank you for your service. Oh, you didn't, sir. Oh, you failed the physical. On purpose? Like I said, my mom was happy that I was blind in my left eye because, oh, TBT, thank you. <laughs> Look, there you go. You're still there. Uh, God bless you. The um, uh, My mom was glad I was blind in my left eye. And uh, so that made me 4F. But by the time I turned 18, the draft was no longer. I, I mean, I remember stressing about it a little bit when I was a kid because I think when I was 10 or, well, 10 no, I wouldn't have thought about it then, but maybe at 14 or 15, I thought about it, but I don't know. It was also kind of one of those things where not that many, I didn't know many people in the military. So if I knew anybody, so that wasn't a reality in my head. I'm like, well, I don't know. Why would I go in the military? So um, you never get to see it. Well, oh, because you're working, not your fault. <laughs> God bless you for, thank me for all I do. Easy. Uh, yeah. Well, on this day, let's thank those that actually do something other than entertain us, <laughs> this little, this group here, Charlie B. Morning. Yeah, Bruce, thank you. I, yeah, I've been really busy, so um, working on a TV show um, that takes place in uh, Bangkok, I think. So I was doing a lot of doing a lot of baritone. Oh, I put away my baritone acoustic. Um, I was doing some baritone acoustic, baritone electric, and that's not Bangkok me, but I had that the the pin, and I can get that out. I'll show you. Everybody take a sip. Now, normally this would have a large, giant, you can see this hole right there. There's this giant thing, spun, it doesn't do anything, it's just ornamentation. Uh, but this is called a pin, and it's kind of like a dulcimer. If you look at the, at the frets, and it, it, I didn't put those markers on there because I, 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 in fact, I should probably take those off if I can. I think they're, oh yeah, they're just stickers. I could take them off. Um, but you'll notice it's a semitone, semitone meaning one fret, a half step. Half, one fret, semitone, half step, they all mean the same thing. Okay, so half step, half step, half step, whole step. 
so it's not a chromatic. I'd like to get a chromatic one made for me. That way I could just tune it maybe like a guitar and just play it. Um, and then another whole step and a half step. So it's got this... Kind of like a cigar box guitar, huh, Bruce? Has a similar tone. I notice that the C... Oh, uh, where's this? F... That note really hops out of the instrument when I'm recording it. It's like you, I can see the waveform. And if I'm playing like a B flat, and then I play a, a D, D flat, and then I hit the C, it like it jumps up really loud. It's almost like the body is tuned to that one note, which it is, you know, just the shape of the body. And this is actually pretty uniform for, for a pin. It's spelled P-H-I-N. But in Thailand, if it's a T-H or a P-H, it's a hard T and a hard P. If it's just T and P, it's a TH sound and a PH sound. Isn't that funny? So it's like, okay, that's weird. Um, so it, to accommodate written melodies, I sometimes have to tune it really weird ways and finger weird things and stuff to be able to, because the composer, while I told him how the, the fret w works on it, um, he, didn't, uh, he didn't really... Mostly what I'm doing is single note. Single note kind of stuff. But, you know, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever pick, pull this out because we're done with the series. To, uh, six episodes. I don't know what it's called. So once I find out, um, I can let you know. I think it's on Netflix. I did um, guitars on a animated series on Netflix uh, called uh, Samurai Rabbit Usagi, I think is what it's called. Um, and the composer there, she's from she's from Tokyo, or no, she's from outside of Tokyo in Japan. And uh, so that was fun. I've been working for her a lot lately on uh, different. She does a lot of movies and TV shows, and also we did some commercials. So, all right. Yeah, and a reminder, any any Super Chat funds will be going to the wedding fund. <laughs> so that money. Oh, you okay, TBT, you've been playing. Uh, yeah, for six months. And if you, you know, go to my, um, uh, go to my um, playlist. It's, I'm not really good at organizing my playlist. Um, when I do a video, I try to put it in the appropriate play playlist. I can put it in as many playlists as I want to. But sometimes I put too many things in the basics playlist. Um, but you can check out that. I have a very popular videos on how to, you know, help with playing the F bar chord and the B bar chord or the B flat. Either one is both complex or difficult for beginners. Um, I talk about capoing. I've a lot of capoing videos. Open tuning is not something you want to necessarily investigate right now. Uh, some players they just have always played in dad gad, which is kind of weird to me. Uh, but I'm sure if you're a beginner, you're playing in what's called standard tuning, um, which is E A D G B E. Eat at Denny's, get bad eggs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is that what you heard in? in the, yep, Don Young. Yeah, right, Joseph. Yeah. Oh man. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do have all skill levels here, um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, <laughs> that the pin. The weird thing, like I said, about the pin. Okay, so uh, a, a dulcimer, or I have a strum stick. Oh, I'll be right back. I'll get that. Hold on. Now, this these strings are really old. I've never really used this, uh, but um, I. I you can see it also is missing frets. But instead of half step, half step, half step, whole step, whole step, instead of the minor sound that the pin has, 
this is only major scale. It's a major scale, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. And you're like, and, and so you generally what you, you tune it to like D, A, D. Let me see what it's tuned to. It's just been hanging. It's, I have all these instruments hanging up, these, just the weird instruments, the weird little ones. I have them hanging in my hallway and in my bathroom. Um, and I'm going to go down to D. Oops. It has double has double strings on top. So you so you would basically tune something like this. This is basically a dulcimer you can play standing up. Dulcimer you usually play overhanded like this. Like droney G thing or D thing, sorry, D A D. The blue book is a Juan Martin uh, uh, 42 graduating solos, you know, like start really simple flamenco. It has tab in it too, flamenco solos, and then it gets more and more complex. Um, kind of, this was one of the main books that taught me how to do the Raschiato. Um, I never got to the end of it. Um, it gets pretty, pretty hard at the end. Um, you know, some pretty elaborate. And it, the interesting thing is like the lack of bar lines and stuff in flamenco music. It's, it's such an improvised kind of thing. Yeah, I don't have, yeah, the wallpaper. ever use this um maybe maybe once or twice it's fun to play um i i use a dulcimer every now and then um i would use this i would use the dulcimer oftentimes too with a bow uh, which is kind of a cool sound just tune it to a to a, a, a you know root five root kind of thing and then bow it it just gives us so i have an, one dulcimer that's um chromatic that i had made for me and i have another another dulcimer that's that's fretted like this and that one I actually strung up with heavy strings, low low strings, and tuned it way down. And I use that for kind of bowing, droney, uh, bass note kind of thing. So, yeah. Would you buy a, a Martin HE28 over a Taylor same type of Ryan, that's a great question. I probably would. <laughs> you know, I, I think I'm the only guitar player that's actually technically at the same time been kind of an endorsed artist for tar Taylor and Martin. Um, not officially, like not on their websites or anything like that, but I, back in the 90s, uh, 97, I started teaching clinics for Maranatha Music and Taylor was one of the sponsors. And at the time, I only had one acoustic. It was a Gibson Dove. And um, so I didn't want to take, the pickup didn't work very good on that. I, I didn't want to take it on the road. It was a big guitar. The case was huge. So I went out and because I was going to have to teach acoustic classes and electric classes. This is before 9-11, so I could actually, believe it or not, I, with the exception, in 40 flights, technically, you know, round trip wise, over 80 flights, probably 100 flights, um, I only twice had to check my guitar. And one time, they actually didn't check it. They actually found a place for it on the airplane, but didn't tell me until I was leaving the plane. So... I was able to take two two guitars on the plane. <laughs> this is before 9/11, um, when I was teaching these clinics and acoustic and electric. <laughs> now I put the electric in a soft bag, and the acoustic was in a hard case. I don't know. How, to be honest, I got an overhead. I got in early. I somehow just managed to get it in there. You know, sometimes I had to ask people, "Hey, can I put your coat on top of my, you know, guitar?" Things like that. It wasn't it wasn't very difficult. I mean, I would sometimes hide it as best I could so they couldn't see it, but um, the, uh, um, so I, I got, yeah, Maranatha music with Chuck Smith. Yep. Originally. Yep. And, um, so I, um, 
the crazy thing was that Taylor was a sponsor and I bought my Loudon and that's after I paid, I think I paid $1,500 for that Loudon, probably the, at the time the most I'd ever paid for a guitar. Uh, but I knew I was going to get paid really well to do these clinics. So I was like, okay, this is cool, you know. And um, I was actually, it was actually one of those gigs that kind of showed up right when I was very discouraged and thought, okay, I'm going to quit playing guitar and get a real job. And then this gig showed up and it was like encouragement because people, that I, I was valued by people that could pay me for my value. <laughs> if that makes sense. It's a very bizarre profession being a musician. So, uh, so the, so I, so then they call me and say, oh, uh, by the way, uh, you know, Taylor wants you to talk to him. So I, I call Taylor and they say, hey, what guitar do you want? I went, what? Oh, we're going to send you a guitar. It's yours to keep. And I went, what? <laughs> and so I said, I really didn't know their catalog. So they said, well, the other guitar players are all getting an 814 CE. I went, okay. So I got a free 18, 814 CE at the time. At the time, it was like a $2,400, $2,500 guitar, maybe more. Um, so... Um, so the, um, so that, so I, I had that. And then, um, at the NAMM show a few years later, I was talking to someone about, um, you know, talking to different manufacturers about making a baritone guitar. And I talked to Bob Taylor, Taylor, and he said, Oh no, we're not making a baritone guitar in the next year. Of course they came out with one. This happened to me with Bob every year. I said, are you guys going to make ever make ukuleles? Oh, no, we're not going to make ukuleles. Next year, they came out with ukuleles. I said, are you guys going to make classical guitars? Oh, no, those tuners are too expensive. We, we, we couldn't justify it. And then the next thing you know, um, oh, you can get an amp at any point, TBT. The only problem with getting an amp is that you're going to be noisier and um, uh, you might be annoying people. It's like the kid with the violin out of tune. Um, Can you learn samba? Sure, you can learn samba. I have a, where's my samba book? Do I have that out? No, I got a lot of flamenco books out right now. <laughs> it's like, what the heck? Um, I have, well, I have a Brazilian book that's really good. Um, what should your practice, what should you practice during your routine? Um, you know, I kind of, I, I you, you definitely kind of want to break it up, you know, into, I can just simplify it. If you're going to practice for, you know, I say in my video, practice for five minutes. And the reason I say that is not because I want you to practice for five minutes and that's all you need to do. No, I, I, I say psychologically, you may not pick up the guitar if you think you've got to practice for an hour, right? All of us have busy lives. It's like, I don't want to spend the next hour playing guitar. It's like going to the gym. It's like, that's a, I got to get dressed. I got to get in the car. I got to drive to the other side of town. I got to go to the gym workout. You know, this is a two and a half hour time you know, waster, not waster, but you know what I mean. So, um, but if you say, if you mentally think five minutes, I'm going to just do this for five minutes, then uh, that'll turn into 10 or 15 or 20 because you're having fun or you're working something out or whatever. But if you're going to do more like a half an hour or an hour of concentrated time, I would try to divide it up between stuff that you need to work on and stuff that's fun. Dessert is always after the meal, right? So what you could do is you could, um, and I should do a video on this is on how to practice. I, you know, it's been a while since I practiced. I used to practice from the age of 15 to the age of 35. I almost religiously had an eight hour practice re re regime. Um, and then once the kids started getting older and I started getting busier working, I kind of would subtract from that eight hours how much if I played five hours in a day working, playing guitar for five hours, not not including students like gigging or, or doing a session or something, I would remove that from the eight hours. So I would still have like three hours to work. But um, now it's like I've got the guitar in my hand 10, 15 hours a day. So I don't, I don't really, I don't have time to practice. And uh, I'm always working new things up. So, um, but I would break it up between stuff that's, that you got to learn or that you want to learn that's difficult, you know, techniques, start slow on everything and speed it up slowly. Um, and then things that are kind of maybe a little frustrating, maybe not fun. And then the fun stuff, whether it's like, oh, I really want to learn Stairway to Heaven. So you start working on that. And that's always fun to learn to work on learning a song you want to learn. But doing exercises or scales or chord exercises or technique things, those aren't always fun. 
Um, so you push those at the beginning of your practice time and then save the fun stuff for the end. So you've got this something to look forward to, something that worth fighting towards. And then the stuff at the end, you you know, those will get more and more complex. So uh, <laughs> two main meals instead. You could do that. That's kind of how I practice. I didn't usually have a lot. I mean, it wasn't, it was fun for me to practice challenging, but I would do Segovia scales. I would do Giuliani arpeggio. So I do classical stuff. I pull out the jazz book. I start reading through real book stuff. I'd um, practice um, different uh, jazz scales and things like that. Um, I would, the things I didn't work on are often things that I needed to have that I did like working on tone. Like that was something that never, I never occurred to me to turn up an amp. And that goes to your question, uh, TBT, you know, should you get an app? I'll tell you, one of the things I tell people, and this is this is difficult sometimes for some people, especially if you live in a closed environment. Um, but if you are playing live, like I play at church um, and every week and uh, multiple services, and I can get there early and play through my amp loud so I can practice playing loud because one of the things you do you jam in your bedroom and it, it sounds so good, but it's so quiet. It's like, oh, and you're by yourself and there's no drums, no bass, no keys, no other guitar players, no singers. And you're just like, oh man, I'm, I'm killing this. And then you get to the gig and your guitar is like, whoa, it's so loud. And it's, the strings are feeding back and everything, every mistake is amplified and every squeak is amplified. And you just, it, it freaks you out and you play bad because you're distracted by all the extra things you weren't practicing. So oftentimes what I tell people is I say, look, create the gig at home. If you're standing up at the gig, stand up at home when you're practicing, at least when you're practicing the set that you're going to do at church or at your gig. Practice standing up. So your pedal board's there. If you're going to be using a wah-wah or a volume pedal, you know, you practice standing up. It's totally different ergonomics if you're sitting down using a wah or a volume. See, I can use a wah and a volume sitting down with both feet at the same time, which sounds weird, but I actually do that because um, the Vox Wah back in the day, was it the Vox Wah? No, it was the Mutron Wah. You could have uh, volume and Wah at the same time. And I like that sound. Uh, uh, Terry Cass from Chicago used that. So that, you know, so, but that, I couldn't do it standing up. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So, uh, I mean, I, I suppose if I, I don't know if I strapped him to the floor. I, no, I still don't think, am I strapped my feet to the, to the pedals? Maybe, I don't know. There might be. A way I could create a really fun TikTok video doing that. But, uh, yeah, so this is a strum stick. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, how long should I practice without but my wife seeds another year <laughs> without strings on my guitar? Oh, wah, wah. Wow, we got a lot of people on here. Well, let me catch up on some of these questions. Sorry. Um, but, yeah, so, okay. My que the, You asked about the Martin and the thing. So I made a love connection at the NAMM show with Martin. Yeah. To me, a Martin will be harder to play, okay? So here's your here's the two sides of that coin, okay? A tailor will be easier to play. If something's easier to play, you're probably gonna sound better on it, all right? Because you're not gonna be fighting the guitar so much. And you can get any guitar set up, but Bob Taylor likes to say that he starts building his guitars from the neck out. So the neck has to be playable. Um, and the first guitar he ever made, which is owned by a friend of mine, it was a 12 string. It was a great American guitar company, and he has number one. My friend has, and Bob's tried to buy it from him for years, and he won't sell it. Uh, my friend, he's a he's a he's a psychologist, so he, or psychiatrist, so he makes lots of money, so he doesn't need Bob's money. <laughs> so I don't know what he's gonna do with that guitar, but uh, I've played it. He took lessons from me, so I have I've I've played that guitar, and it played amazing. And so I do have I have uh, see I have an 814 that was given to me. I bought a 655, which is a 12 string. If you're gonna buy a 12 string, I always Taylor is the way to go because they're so easy to play. Martin 12 strings are so hard to play. It's almost, you know, I don't even know if they make them anymore, to be honest. But the other side of that coin is, man, a Martin sounds like a guitar. When you hear a guitar on the radio, when you hear a guitar from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, acoustic guitar, it's almost always a Martin. It's not a Taylor. So you to get that sound, that Johnny Cash or that, you know, the, the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young sound or whatever, it's often going to be, and I'm not sure if they all use Martins or not, it's going to be a Martin guitar or it's going to be a Gibson guitar. Uh, but Gibsons, to me, are real hit and miss. I, I've got a really good Gibson, and I got stupid lucky because it was the first acoustic I ever bought. Okay, so there's that question kind of answered. I, I, not, I didn't really answer it. I just said, look, if you want a, a guitar that's going to play easier, you might sound better on it because 
It plays easier. Go for the Taylor. If you want a guitar that sounds like the guitars you've heard your whole life, especially that HD28 is a great guitar. Mine's a, mine is a um, D35. And I got this thing for 1100 bucks at Guitar Center used. And I put a lot of work into it. But uh, yeah. it, it was an abused child. I mean, it was turned into a lefty and then back into a righty. So you can see where it was routed out and everything. It's like, I use this all the time. sounds like a guitar. Uh, a Taylor sounds like a Taylor to me. A Gibson sounds like a Gibson to me. A Martin sounds like a guitar. Isn't that crazy? That's just my opinion. Um, and this whole business of guitar and everything, tech uh, gear is very full of lots of opinions. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, there were some other three. How can I learn some? Oh, I, yeah. I, I, let me see. <laughs> give me a second. I'll go to the other room. Uh, let me find this. Hold on a second. And I can give you a link for the um, a YouTube, I mean, a, an Amazon link for this. Hold on. I don't, I don't know where that book is. It's around somewhere. Where was it? Let me see if I can find it on Amazon. Sorry. Um, I thought it was on the stand here. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, here, here it is. Okay. So here's this. This book has, a, okay, here's the frustrating thing about this book. And it's me, not anybody. <laughs> I will sit down with this. It's so fun. They're very hard to kind of, um, I was doing um, with Alex, we were doing, um, um, uh, shoot, what's that song called? Um, Daydreaming by Radiohead. One of my favorite Radiohead songs. And it's it's piano, it's not guitar. But if you look at this notation, it's in 6-8. Um, the melody is playing 6 eighth notes per bar, and the bass is playing 4 dotted eighth notes. Um, so it's a 3 over 2 pattern. Um, it's kind of difficult, you know, it's like... It's hard to get that bone, the thumb doing the, and then the, I guess it takes a minute to get that. And that's the thing with, with Bossa Nova, the thumb's doing one thing and the fingers are doing another thing. And so uh, this, but this book has really good examples. It's a really good lesson book. I think it came with a, did it come with a disc? I don't know. It doesn't, I don't see a pouch for a disc. But a lot of these books, let me let me let me try to find it on Amazon real quick. And uh, that way, if you buy any buy it from Amazon, uh, if you buy it from this link, um, then um, I get a little piece of the you know I get like up to five percent, I think up to five percent of the sale. But if you go and buy anything from there, um, yeah, here it is. Uh, yeah, if you, you know, it's, it's five, four and a half stars, 65 ratings. So it's this, you know, it's, it's a pretty solid, I'm not a, I buy a lot of books and then I don't get the most out of them. I'm, I'm really guilty of that. I think a lot of people do that. Uh, but here's that, here's that link. Okay. So you can go there. If you do any shopping at Amazon, you can save that link and, you know, I make a little bit of coin from it. Uh, I just got $25 this month from Amazon for, for stuff. It's not, I'm not getting rich off of it or anything like that. But every little bit helps and, and justifies me doing this, you know. Um, so, um, but it, I, the funny thing is I'll, I'll work up a pattern and I think I have it down and I have it down. I literally have it down. A week later, I can't. I've forgotten it. So it's something about, something about the Brazilian thing. You know, it's, 
I didn't grow up in Brazil. I have a friend that's Brazilian. In fact, I played with him this last weekend at church. He's a bass player, and he plays great Brazilian guitar. He can do all of those things. And he was showing me some tricks, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. How do you do that? You know, and I'm watching him, and, he, and I'm getting it. I'm like, pick up my guitar, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool, you know, and and then uh, and then I forget it. <laughs> it's just something about it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, pretty good numbers here. We got forty. I got forty six here. Um, so let's see. Uh, what kind of slim body acoustic would you recommend? Uh, older, you know, I. Yeah, the big acoustics are hard. I, you know, the 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 slim body acoustic is going to sound like this. Okay, they're going to sound like they have. They're going to sound like a cheap acoustic with a head cold. <laughs> Um, and you can find them. Okay, I'm going to give you a secret right now. Okay, you want to find, uh, hopefully, hey, St Staley, what's going on? Staley, Straley. Uh, is money the justification for your channel? Um, is money the justification for my channel? No, it is not. But it doesn't hurt. And I work for a living, so I have to um, plan out my week uh, based on work. And if I'm too tired to do YouTube stuff, um, then I won't do it. Um, but, um, um, yeah, practicing with a metronome is a great idea. Um, but yeah, as far as doing this for the money, no, my original reason for doing this was when I, when my dad died and about 11, 11 years ago in July, was it 11 years, years ago this July, because he, he died three days after I turned 50. And um, everything he knew about jazz, which was volumes, everything he knew about baseball was, you know, he was one of those guys who was a walking baseball dictionary. Um, and everything he knew about family history. My parents, when they were first married, went to Europe for a month and um, he could remember every meal they had, every restaurant and every city they went to in Europe. My mom couldn't remember any of that. Um, and so, you know, all of that when he died was instantly gone. And I had just, like, right that year, I had stopped teaching guitar lessons. I had taught from the age of 15 up until the age of 50. So I taught for 35 years, um, at some points having 20 students a week and more. I taught 40 students a week in Indiana before I moved to California. Um, when I was 20, I had 40 students every week. Um, but at the uh, here in California, I think the max I ever got to was about 20 students. It was how I paid the bills. It was how I kept a guitar in my hands. And um, so when I stopped teaching, I developed this pedagogy, this style of teaching, this the methodology. And I decided I'd start to put it up on YouTube so that when I die, people could benefit from it. That was my motivation. So my motivation for starting the channel was doing that. Um, at some point, someone, um, I can't remember his name. We're Facebook friends now. But he's a, he's a guy in Sweden. He said, he got on Reddit. I had 800 subscribers. And he said, why doesn't Tom have more subscribers? And I got 400 in one day, I think. Like, I went from 800 to 1,200 in one day. And then shortly after that, somebody said, hey, you should do videos on dadgad and i got up to eight thousand and at that point somebody said hey you should do a video for beginners and that's how i got to 105,000. so i'm making money now um, on it and you know if i had a million subscribers i might only do this or if i had two million subscribers it might i don't think it would replace all my income but um, i like doing what i do so i don't know if i would want to do youtube videos all, all day long and editing and all that stuff it's it's fun but it's not my only thing so um uh, so, yeah, now the practice, like I said, the practice routine, I was very consistent for like 10 years. I would even take guitars on vacation, mainly because I didn't ever feel like when I was in my 20s and 30s that I ever deserved a vacation because I wasn't working enough. Beth was supporting us. You know, the first 10 years of our marriage, she was the maid breadwinner until she quit her job. And it was like a big step of faith that, um, but we wanted to homeschool our kids. So she stayed home to do that. And I, I was at home anyway, and I was doing the, uh, just doing guitar lessons and playing at church and doing sessions and writing music. And eventually it started to turn into a, almost a real career. So, uh, any suggestions for a parlor guitar? Um, I have a small, uh, a 1924 Martin, what is it? It's a, it's a, HD 28. It's a small body guitar. It's a parlor guitar. Um, 
Parlor guitars, I think, would be a better way to go than... Um, I have two parlor guitars, technically, if that Martin's technically a parlor guitar. I have a, um, a shoot, a Larravee parlor guitar that I have tuned high strung. Because um, a high strung, it's going to sound like it, you don't need a big body for a high strung. So I went with a smaller, at the time, cheaper guitar. I think that parlor guitar was like 350 when I got it. I think Beth got it for me. And I, uh, I think they're going for a thousand now for that same guitar, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, parlor guitar is much better way to go. A parlor guitar is just a smaller body guitar. It's still fairly deep, so you still have that to overcome. Uh, but it's smaller than. Thank you, Joseph. Cheers. Bought my coffee. Um, it's smaller. Um, it's. I think they're slightly smaller than a classical guitar. Classical guitars are smaller um, than. Um, than full body dreadnought guitars. This is a full, this is a dreadnought. So this is a big body. It's thick, and I don't know the dimensions on it exactly. But um, jumbos are bigger. Um, I do I have a jumbo? My twelve strings a jumbo. Uh, I have two dreadnoughts. I have the the Gibson Dove, and I have that one. Um, but yes, I would definitely is specifically which parlor guitars to recommend. No, um, and there's cheap ones. There's companies. There's a company in like the Czech Republic that makes guitars that are actually really reasonably priced and fairly well built, I believe. Um, I can't remember the name of it, uh, the company, but I've seen some stuff. Uh, Sean, Sean the Prawn, what do you think of Elliot Smith's song Structuring? Oh, um, how does he find those chords that transform the song? Uh, where, what time is it? Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> because Alex will be here at 11. Uh, Alex is a, my son Alex is a huge Elliot Smith fan. I didn't get into Alex Smith, I mean, Elliot Smith, um, <clears throat> but I do know he's a, fin I mean, I, I know his, some of his work, I know um, he's a great songwriter, Tragedy, um, I believe he committed suicide, um, but <clears throat> uh, I, I'm a big um, believer in that, you, you know, you do, you do want to have, you it mentioned, let's see, in that, Find those chords that transform the song. Yeah, it's that's a great study, and I bet you somebody's done a video on that um, specifically on on how maybe how does Elliot Smith write songs? That could be something that Alex would do a good video on. I think he he, he hasn't done a video in a long time. Um, oh, the secret I was going to tell you pertaining to the thin body acoustic guitar. I don't think it was a secret. What I just was like. I, I think a parlor would be a better way to go. I, I went like this because I like they sound like they have a head cold. Um, oh, the secret. Oh, that I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Have I mentioned this before? Um, all right, I'm gonna give away a, a purchasing secret. It may not be that, but check out shopgoodwill.com. Okay, all one shopgoodwill.com. Uh, they use eBay as a thing, but it's not on eBay. So their stuff is not on eBay. And they use the eBay engine for purchasing stuff. So you have an eBay account, you can purchase stuff there. And it's all bid, um, but man, you can get some great great deals on instruments sometimes. Um, I think it's been, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing it now only because, um, I, can, I can type in the link here for you. Um, I'm only sharing it now because I think it's been discovered. Um, if, you sh if you go to guitars, um, if you go to go to like the guitar tab and then sort by most expensive, you'll see. In fact, I just saw. Speaking of a small bodied Martin, I saw a small bodied Martin. I think it was a, I don't know how, what year it was. It was pretty old, and um, it was already up to twenty two hundred dollars or something like that. So, people have discovered this. Mostly dealers, sadly, you know, like, um, uh, you know, vintage. Oops, shop goodwill. Sorry. Let me see what's up there right now. I mean, you're all looking it up right now, so we're all going to be on it together right here. Um, you can go to categories, scroll down to musical instruments, click on that, just click on uh, guitars and basses, and then the tab, the time ending soon is change that to price highest first. Gets rid of a lot of the crap. Uh, there's a Gibson uh, SG, a three pickup SG in there for 3000 now. Vintage Gibson acoustic with carrying case. Oh, this is a really old Gibson. 
Here's a 10-string ukulele by Martin. That's kind of cool. Um, just some weird stuff. Uh, so for this Gibson, this is like a really old Gibson, and they don't have a lot of information. They'll have pictures, but they don't really know what they have. Um, and this one is in Oakland. Yeah. Oh, that back is weird. What's the back? Oh, no, that's a crack through the back. So it's got a big crack in it, you know. And so, you know, you're going to be competing now with resellers, on, sadly. Uh, the Martin ukulele, this is a really old one because it's stamped on the back. It doesn't have something on the headstock. Uh, that's, a that's actually technically a tipple, and I've been wanting to get one of those. But that, I think it's already at a price. I ordered a tipple, and I had to send it back because it wasn't very good. Um, yeah, I can't justify buying it right now, but... Um, Shipping price nineteen dollars. You can't beat that. I mean, it's it's a really good. Um, oh, uh, when would you think about changing the saddle on that? Okay, I just did that on my flamenco guitar because I sanded it down too much. Um, so, oh, let me just one thing. I want to go back to that shop goodwill and see what else was there real quick. So, so that's the top three. Then there's a there's a Jade Forty. Acoustic guitar with a hard case. Um, there's a, another Gibson electric. Oh, it's a, it's a, wow, is that brand new with a pick card cover on it still? I don't know what the heck that thing is. A Fender Ultra Lux Stratocaster. A Rickenbacker, oh, style. semi hollow body, so a copy of a Rickenbacker. Mexican Strat. Yeah, so quickly it gets to the kind of weird stuff. Um, there's some weird guitars like this unbranded wooden electric guitar. I mean, there's some stuff in there. You go, there's an Ovation guitar, a K electric, an old K electric, which is kind of cool, but a lot of them need repair. Um, so I just replaced the saddle on my uh, Flamenco guitar because I had sanded it too low. My classical guitar's action is a little higher. Um, and so the saddle is the, is the thing down here. Okay, this is the saddle. And then this is the, this is the nut. Um, I don't really, I've never, I don't think I've ever really changed the nut. I mean, maybe if you wear it out, I'm not sure how you would wear that out. Um, if it's buzzing, if the guitar is buzzing open, it might be, this is too low, but I don't know how that would get there. Um, you also might change it. If you've got a, a fairly cheap guitar and it's a plastic and you want to use bone or bone, uh, uh simulated bone, um, uh, you could totally do that, and you'll pay a little extra money, get a little bit better tone. It might give you a little bit more projection out of your instrument. So it might be there might be that. Um, so, yeah, so, Sam, that was the secret I was talking about. Um, yeah, I put the Discord link. It should be uh, pinned up there. Uh, yeah, so, Sam, dig it. You can find all sorts of, you can find tools up there. Like, if you are into, like, tools, it's a great place to find tools that you don't have. Um, and um, so that's... Uh, that was secret, but we'll be bidding against each other now, but it's all right. I have bought some stuff from it. So, um, and it comes packed. It's, you know, shipped. I, I bought some liars, um, L Y R E just like for 10, 12 bucks. Nobody buys them. So I wanted to have them. They're a pain in the butt to tune. You've got to tune them with one of these because they're one to one gear ratio. Um, but I, I was using them for different effecty things. So it's kind of fun. Uh, you have an Epiphone Florentine cut PPR. Okay. Yeah, I think you could probably get, you know, you could get a thin body acoustics, you know, for a hundred bucks. Um, you know, they're they're better for plugging in. I mean, most acoustics, I don't care how good the acoustic is or how good the pickup is, they all it's a third sound. I always say that there's electric guitar sound, there's acoustic guitar sound, and then there's the the piezo electric or piezo, however you want to say it, piezo. I've heard all three of those. Um, it's a raging controversy. Um, but that would be one of those things where, you know, I, you, it would be a good, maybe good for a plug-in stand-up guitar because it's not going to sound a whole lot worse than a, a Taylor plugged in. I mean, maybe, I mean, I've, I've heard, I'm hearing some pretty good pickups. I like the Sunrise system, just really expensive. Um, and my, the one, when I play plug-in guitar, I play my Loudon, but even that one, when I have it in the ears, it just sounds like, man, it sounds, it doesn't sound great, so. Uh, but it is a comfortable guitar. That is true, Joe. Joseph. Uh, let's see. Did I miss any other? I'm sure I missed other questions. Um, let's see. 
How can I get good at guitar? Karen X Karen XD asked. Um, um, well, I mean, you know, it's it's just practice. Um, and I, I, you know, have a couple of videos. And one of the things, too, I think is play with others. If you can find someone that's even at the same skill level as you, if you have someone who's a lot better than you, they're not going to want to jam with you. This is not. This is not going to be fun for them. Because you're not, you're, you're not going to be able to comp behind them so they can solo. If you could just get good at playing blues and E, we did a whole thing on this, on my live stream. 12 bar blues and E, it's harder than it looks. So many people can't get all the way through a 12 bar blues without taking away a bar or adding a bar or forgetting to go to the four the second time or going to the four too long. If you can get the basic 12 bar blues down, um, then at least you, you're, you have some value to another guitar player that wants to practice jamming or a trumpet player or a trombone player or a bass player or a piano player or any flute player or whatever, a singer who wants to practice with you. Um, and then then they'll, if they're good enough to solo over the blues, they're probably good enough to play the blues, then they can trade off to you and then you can practice playing over the blues, you know? And so, you know, it's kind of one of those things when, you, when you're sitting next to another person, you, just, you can see uh, what they're doing and you can maybe get a little bit better uh, just through osmosis. You know, that's just one, one thing I suggest. Um, also, the, the fear factor is a big thing. You, you, if you know that on Tuesday you're going to be getting together Tuesday night with a couple other guitar players to jam, you're probably going to practice leading up to that. You may practice Tuesday afternoon, but you may also practice Monday, Sunday, Saturday, Friday, and uh, and you'll be better this Tuesday than you were the last Tuesday, uh, and because you don't want to be shown up. So, um, welcome back, Cotter. That was <laughs> Cotter. Uh, yeah, totally is welcome back, Cotter. Uh, see. Holly is lurking. Oh, okay. Well, Holly, how you doing? Good to see you. Uh, Bruce is here. Is Dennis? Have I seen Dennis? Dennis? I haven't seen Dennis at all. Interesting. All right. Um, what else? What is it? Uh, oh, yeah. So, hey, Catherine, did that kind of answer your question? Um, ch you change the nut to if sometimes it's used done to. Back in the 80s, everybody was putting brass on everything, on all the electric guitars to improve sustain. I don't know if it really worked or not, but it, it kind of got, it got silly. Um, and, um, and then um, uh, the changing the nut, the fake bone stuff, I don't think it's a problem with using real bone. I mean, if you eat hamburger, there's lots of bone left over from <laughs> the acquisition of hamburger meat, so... I'm sure that I don't know what kind of bone they typically use, and I don't. I'm sure I've got bone somewhere on some of my guitars. Um, they don't. You can't get um, tortoise pickup picks anymore. You haven't been able to do that since I was a kid. That's been like, you know. I think there are some people that make faux to tortoise picks, um, but it's funny because that's what guitar picks are made out of for years and years and years. So if um, I, one of my oldest picks are, I maybe. I don't know, where is that pick? I've got a pick. See, I got a lot of picks. Um, you know, then Dunlops, I got felt picks. Bass players used these back in the 60s, but ukulele players used them too. I use, believe it or not, I use bottle caps as a pick. This is my favorite bottle cap pick right here. I think it's a Pepsi bottle cap, and I have not found more like this. So I'm guarding it with my life. You know, like bottle cap pick. Yeah, if I want, if I'm working on something that's like a scary movie or a game or video, you know, something that's got, you know, I get this sound. Uh, you can't get that sound from a pick, but if I do like minor seconds, do like clusters. It's a kind of a cool sound. So I can use a lot of things for picks. I've got, I don't know that I've ever used this, but I've got a uh, ceramic thimble. 
Um, of course, I got various thumb picks, metal ones. But, uh, these are not, I don't use these for picks. These are great for strap locks. And these are from uh, Grolsch Beer. I'm going to do a video on uh, Grolsch Beer and, you know, poor man's strap lock. Um, my main pick right now is these gravity picks. I use these primarily on an electric. Um, mainly because they're a little bit bigger than the picks I used before. Now this, here's a blue chip pick. These things are like, that's a $60 pick there. I'm not even sure why. Uh, but it's it's pretty kind of shaped. Like it's it feels like a pick you've had for 20 years. So it's kind of nice that in the, it does sound really good for strumming. Um, this is, here's speaking of bone, here's a bone pick made in China. Oh, I hope it's not human bone. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I wonder if you can tell, the grain would probably tell you. It's very polished, it feels like rock, but it says bone on it. It feels like a rock though. Um, different thumb picks, like I said. I mean, even rubber, these things I could use. This a pick. See, this one kind of looks like a tortoiseshell, but it's not. But yeah, um, I really love um, this this pick. I use a lot for solo acoustic melody, and this is uh, 3.5 millimeters. And this is made by Wiegand Picks, a guy in, in uh, I think he's in, it's filthy though, um, in um, uh, uh, France. So you kind of have to order him. From, he's got PayPal account. For it's just got a really, especially one of the things too, you pick up here, get a, a warmer. for bluegrass he also makes a bluegrass pick it looks like where is it here it is it's it's pretty thick and that's a Wiegand bluegrass pick w-e-g-e-n Donald, hey, good to, good to see you. I love your singing on all the stuff. The peg is my favorite. Uh, let's see. Can a right, can a right hand, sure. Um, sure, I mean, interesting. That's a, that's a, that's interesting. I, um, mandolin is a, I, I love mandolin. It's because it's, if your hand, if you have small hands, it's actually a really good instrument. It's hard to, harder to play with big hands. Um, and um, so I really love mandolin, and I keep it tuned like a mandolin. I don't tune it like a guitar. Um, so I, um, um, so you're 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 you can strum with your right hand. I mean your left hand, but because but the, because of the injury, you can't fret. So did you play guitar before? Um, I you probably can. Um, I have a friend. Um, What's, let's see, he had, a, he had a website, a blog called What's Right is Left. What's Right is Left. So he was a left-handed architect, and he had cancer that they had to take. It was a very aggressive cancer, um, and they had to cut his arm off right about here. Um, and, I, you know, he was a na next door neighbor. We lived in our building, and I remember going to visit him and when he was in, sitting in bed at home and stuff, and he could still feel his hand, but it was getting, it was pulling in. Like this, it was getting like shorter and smaller. It was such a weird psychological thing, which is totally understandable. But here is an architect who draws for a living, and he was left-handed, and he lost his left hand. Um, and he had, like I said, he had a blog for a while. It was called what, "What's Right Is Left." And um, so he and he, I remember because we managed the building, and he always turned in those checks, and he had the most amazing handwriting. Like, it was just scientific. It was perfect. It looked almost like he typed it. You know, it was so good. And I'll tell you, it wasn't long before, like, less than six months later, he, those checks came in. He was doing it with his right hand just as good. Now, he was also in his early 30s, I think, when this happened. So um, I think the younger you are, the easier it is to make that transition. But, yes, I think you could definitely learn. It's going to be very frustrating. 
uh, but you stick with it. And if it's just if you you know if you just mainly strumming chords, then you can just learn some chords. Um, basic C, G, and D are very simple. All all three of those are two finger chords. Um, you can play four finger bigger chords with them, but you could do all of those chords C, G, E, even E minor with two fingers. Also know that a mandolin. Um, a mandolin uh, string tuning is the bottom four strings of guitar upside down. So a G chord, you play a G like this, you look at the bottom four strings and you just flip it and there's a G chord on a mandolin. A C chord, you can add that E string, a, a C chord on mandolin is just this. A D chord, if you think about having your thumb over here, a D chord on mandolin is just these, okay? So you can, you, when I, once I figured that out, I was like, I was, fast I got I got it fast on a mandolin as far as chords go um, so yeah you can definitely do it. it's just gonna be a lot of work and frustrating but you know and and ukulele might even be simpler um, but you're gonna need to get a left you're gonna need to string it left-handed so um, that means flipping everything upside down unless you play it upside down which you know you could totally do uh, but you may not have a teacher able to do that so uh, my lounge is oh uh, galoot Diaspora. Wait, did you say something about here? Did I miss something? Um, uh, my lounge is overrun to with guitars and paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's pretty much me. Yeah, I can barely move myself. Yeah, Staley. It's it's uh, the mandolin thing. Is it's it's it was a game changer when I realized that. <laughs> no one showed that to me. I just went, wait a minute. <laughs> I tend to use the middle and pinky probably 80% of the time because bone issue in my hand broke as a kid. Oh, I'm sorry, Waves. Yeah, but, you know, I I mean, look look up Django Reinhardt. He was a, a very good guitar player when he uh, got... Rein, Rein, yeah. Um, he was a very, very good guitar player when he, on his wedding night, I think he was 18 years old, on his wedding night... His, he was a gypsy and he lived in a caravan, so he had like a trailer. And um, it was a wedding night and she sold cellophane flowers and they had a, um, a, a caravan full of cellophane flowers. And of course, wedding night, they had the candles and the candles lit the cellophane flowers and his caravan went up like a Roman candle. And he burned his entire body, his left side of his body, was in the hospital for six months. Um, he almost died, and um, he only could use these two fingers. These two fingers were fused together like this. So he could sometimes use these two fingers at a bar, but <laughs> he went on to become one of the most influential, fastest, in ridiculous uh, guitar players in the history of jazz guitar. So that, I say, is an encouragement. You know, So if you're struggling, if you can only use these two fingers, they're probably pretty strong. And Django only used these two fingers. I think I'd rather have these two fingers than those two fingers. But I do have a pretty strong pinky and a middle finger. You know, between the two of them, you could probably play. I, you know, maybe if you're not, if you're not, in, if you've never heard of them, you're not. Gonna, there's actually a book out. I kid you not, where they transcribed the solos and they fingered it two different ways. Um, and so they fingered it for four fingers, and they fingered it for two fingers. And there are times where some of his phrases are easier to do with two fingers than with four fingers. Like the fingers get in the way because the way he has, he had to play um, and the lines he created um, were, um, you know, were, were, were created because of his limitations. Um, so I find that sometimes some of those lines, some of the phrases, they can't, I can't play them with, I need to play them with two fingers. So, uh, no, 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 Stanley. What's up, friend? What's going on, Stanley? Yeah, it would be challenging. Um, a bit, oh, a basic practice amp. Yep, thank you. Basic practice amp, 5, 10, 1. Yeah, practice amp is fine. Um, it's not going to be something you're going to be. You're going to need an amp, ultimately, that fits your gig, whatever the, your gig is. Now, at my church, my amp is actually in another room. Um, you can't hear my amp 
uh, I'm not on stage with it anymore, which is a little bit frustrating because I can't get that interplay between the guitar and the amp. I've talked about that before. Um, so I tend to turn it up too loud in my ears, which is giving me ear damage. Uh, because you're trying to get that energy that you would get from the amp that you can't get. And you're trying to get, it's, it's this psychological thing. Uh, so I have to remember to keep my ears turned down so I don't hurt my ears any more than they're already hurt. Um, uh, those, oh, the hand emojis are just attention Tom. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Matt, I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about that. Yeah, the hand emojis are just stop. Tom, look, so I can see it because sometimes the text goes by really, uh, the text thread goes by really fast and it's hard. Yes, um, strumming, one of the things I would recommend is um, strumming, let me, and I'll get to the co grading thing too. The strumming thing um, is practice with a metronome if you can. You can get a metronome for free for your phone. You don't need to go out and buy one necessarily. Um, the other thing is keep your arm moving. Okay, so like one of the most common grooves is what I call the standard folk groove. It's... keep your arm moving. If you only move your arm when you're strumming the strings, you're gonna it's gonna be this. And if you watch Elvis movies, sometimes Elvis is doing that, right? He's pretending to play the guitar and he's trying to match the strum, but he's only moving his arm. Or anybody that's faking to play guitar. Okay? Now it, it works out okay because it's an even number of strums, but let's say I did a pattern that was one, two and three and four and right? So it was like this. Well, that is seven strums. So now, if I only move my arm when I'm uh, hitting the strings, then on every other bar, I'm going to be starting with a downstroke, and every other bar, I'm going to start with an upstroke. So it's going to be this. Oops, I can't even do it. Yeah, that's you're not going to have any feel with that. So you want to keep your arm moving. Even if you're even if you're just playing what's called footballs, footballs are just whole notes. So two, three, four, two, three, four. Keep that arm moving. And then you just you make contact with the strings whenever you want a strumming. You could do one and. I could do one and and the end of two. when you need it okay so that's that's those are the two key tips for getting your strumming down play practice with the metronome and if you have to slow down a little bit um, and the other one is uh, keep your arm moving don't stop your arm um, let's see okay the question how do you get into co-writing um, so I always say this I had I, you know back in the day when I was in, in bands you know um, Indiana I was in cover bands but once I moved to LA I decided I'm not gonna do cover bands um, that's something I could do in any city. If I'm in LA, I'm going to try to do original bands where if you get a record deal, you could get rich and famous. Okay. So, um, and I was in a band, uh, with a couple buddies and I did all the writing. I wrote the, the song, you know, the guitar parts, even the bass parts, the, um, the lyrics and the melodies, harmonies, everything. Um, and then I had another band with my wife and, uh, same thing, I, my, all the songs that we did that were mine, I wrote 100% of. Um, and then we had, my wife and I had another band, just the two of us, and same thing, you know, she would write a song or something, but not, it was pretty much all my songs. And I had zero success, zero success. And, uh, but my songs were my babies, don't touch my songs, don't change my songs, you know, this is the melody, this is the right, you know, but it just had no success. And, um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> um, oh, and I'll talk, I got to talk about, um, the, uh, uh <laughs> 15 different tunings. That's crazy, Alan, <laughs> but I believe it. Um, so, um, uh, I, I, we're in 2005. I worked on a movie with a friend of mine was scoring a movie, and he had a he had like a ten thousand dollar budget, and he needed a lot of guitar. 
and he, he goes, I, I, I'm not going to get to keep in this money. I'll give you 5000 if you come over. And I had to go over a bunch of times, too. So I you know, probably made, you know, I made minimum wage probably at the time. Um, but uh, and then 5000 for the engineer to mix the whole thing. So he wasn't going to get to keep anything. It was a very, very low budget movie. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so we, he was writing the score, you know, the, the music behind the, the scenes. There's, and I've said this before, there's three types of music in a movie. There's score, which is like you think of John Williams doing the score, or maybe Hans Zimmer. Then there's a um, what's called a um, source, which if somebody walks into a club and you've got like a di disco playing or someone's driving a pickup truck on a dusty road and there's an old country song playing, an instrumental or whatever, those are called source music. So I, I've written, a, you know, since then written a bunch of those kind of things. And then there's also something called needle drums. Like if you look, at, I always give Adam Sandler movies as an example. He'll have a he'll have a Bob Seger tune, and he'll have an Aerosmith tune, and he'll have you know all these his favorite songs from growing up or whatever will make it into his movies. Those are needle drops. Now a lot of times needle drops, all that means is it's a pre-existing song that they have to license to put in the movie. It could be unsigned bands that did a record, and then in this movie it was called Supercross. Um, they had about twenty bands that they had their songs in there, and they had licensed the songs. Probably for maybe five hundred dollars, maybe a hundred dollars. You know, not, not a whole lot. But when the movie airs on TV, they make money. Um, so there's there's a back end to it. It's not you know if it's if you're trying to license a Beatles song or let's say I think if you want to license Purple Haze, it's going to cost you a million dollars. Like um, uh, if you want to put Purple Haze in your movie or your TV show, it's going to cost a million dollars. But if you're an unsigned band or an unknown band, okay, all right. So all that to preface. So. I worked on the score. The, was, we were done with the score. The 20 bands, one of the bands got signed and the record label wanted $20,000 for the, for the song to be in the movie. And they took the song out of the movie and said, no, forget it. And they asked my friend if he would write a song to replace it. And he goes, well, I can't, I can't write a rock song, like a heavy metal song. So it was kind of a Depeche, no, it was like a Nine Inch Nails kind of vibe. So I'll bring Tom in. So Tom, he called me and said, hey, would you come in? It's, they can't pay us. Any, they'll give us a dollar for the license. So it's a legal contract. You know. uh, but we'll own the writers and publishing. I said, sure. What the heck? Take a chance. So I go in there and Jasper and I write this song in a morning. I sang it. He re-sang it because he's a very good singer. Um, but, you know, we did. He wrote some keyboard parts on it. And I wrote guitar. And I wrote the melody and the lyrics and all that stuff. We kind of coll collaborated. So it was 50-50. You know, I, I got a, like a $350 BMI check for that, like, you know, a couple of years later when it started playing on cable and I got like a $500 check and a $1,000 check. And, you know, I made, a, I made a few thousand dollars off that morning. Okay, so in all those years of writing songs by myself, I, they're my babies, don't touch them, I made no money. I write one song with one guy on a movie that no one's seen and I'm making thousands of dollars. And I'm like, wait a minute. So... That's what got me into collaborating. Um, as far as collaborating with people like Justin Bieber, um, that was a lar large part because of Kukarel who brought me into Bieber uh, to Bieber sessions, and I met Justin. And um, in fact, one of the first sessions I did with him uh, when I was it when I met him? it was when I met him was when he wrote a song with um, Taylor Swift. And um, it um, I never got released, but I actually came up with, like, I came in originally to just do guitars on it. doing what, It was just me and Coop. And I think Josh Godwin was there. And uh, I was recording guitars and uh, replaced Taylor's guitars and kind of gave it a vibe. Um, and, uh, and then um, the next day, Coop called and said, hey, would you come in? Oh, no, I know what I did. I, I actually said, you know, this is kind of kind of boring, like I had the vocals were there, so I'm hearing Taylor and, and I'm hearing Justin singing. Um, but it was kind of like, it was the same three chords over and over again. I said, what about if we did this in the bridge? It'll work with their melody, but this, and Kook loved it. He was like, oh man, that's great. So I recorded this guitar part on the bridge. And um, uh, so now I'm, I go to bed that night thinking I've written a song with <laughs> Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift, two of the biggest artists in the world at the time. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is going to be a smash. And uh, Coop calls me the next day and says, Hey, uh, 
they loved what you did with, they want you to put it back the way Taylor did it. I'm like, oh, man. So would you come in today? And then I also want you to put a solo on it. I went, sure. So um, I came in and um, did like this big, big, well, it's funny because that's when Justin showed up and he was just 15 or 16 at the time as a kid. And um, between him and me and Coop, we wrote this like 16 bar rock guitar solo in the, in the middle of this pop song that never, ever got released. Um, that would have been amazing if it, hey, Daniel Shaver, what's going on? Talk, Daniel's a student of mine. I think if it's the same Daniel Shaver, I mean, I don't know how many Daniel Shavers there are. But he was a student of mine for years and years and years. He's gotten into collecting guitars, too. It's a dangerous hobby. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of... Um, and then with, with Justin, um, normally what I do is I send... You know, they'll, they'll ask me to send some hooks. Like ETA was a request. They said, hey, can you do some like uh, pseudo-gospel R&B stuff? So... ETA was probably one of five or six things I sent that I immediately go in my studio and start writing. Um, and I have, um, I write a lot for TV, so I'm always in the studio writing for TV. And then um, if I come up with something that's like, oh, that's cool, I'll open up a new session and I'll lay that down and I'll send it to one of my producers. I'll go, oh, this would be good for Pooh Bear or um, Skrillex might like this or Josh might like this or Justin might like it. So I'll send it to the appropriate producer, depending on what the vibe is on the song. Um, I'll just kind of let the guitar and the moment inspire me. So, yeah. Oh, it's you. Hey. <laughs> I look old, don't I? <laughs> it's been a while since we've seen each other, except on Facebook. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, yeah. I One of my, uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Dave Clark, not from Dave Clark 5, but he's a guitar player. He always had better guitars than me because he had a job. <laughs> So we played it together at church and he always had really like, he had Tom Anderson, he had a giant rack and he had all the stuff and he always had the best gear. And, um, it was funny though. Cause he would always be like, uh, he, Hey, you know, what do you think of this? And I, wow, this is a nice guitar. I'm playing as Tom Anderson. He says, yeah, I'm thinking about changing out the pickups. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, it's, I've already changed them out once, but I'm thinking of changing them out again. And I went, really? And let me hear him. And I go, and I'm playing, I'm like, sounds great to me. And he goes, yeah, it sounds great when you play it. <laughs> and then, like, he's chasing that that bone tone by changing out the pickups, you know. Dave's gotten a lot better. Dave actually quit his job and is playing professionally now. I think he plays full-time guitar. Uh, so, you know, he, 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 he definitely had a lot of what it took, but he was, like, just short, just shy of being able to, to make a living. So um, he quit his... I think he still has his consulting business. He did computer stuff. So it was like he made really good money doing that. It's hard. When you make a lot of money, it's really hard to give that up. That's why I always say, you know, when I talk about minimum wage, like keep raising minimum wage. And I'm like, I'm so glad my first job paid as little as it did. Because if it paid really well, I'd still be doing it. I'd still be, what was my first job? Working at a restaurant. I'd still be mopping floors. That's If that job paid $15 an hour back in, 19, you know, 79 or whatever, I, I'd still be doing it. I'd be like the guy, the, I'd be the best fake Mexican restaurant. The, place, the restaurant was called Gringos. Why would you call your Mexican restaurant Gringos? It makes no sense. It's like, it's called, like, call the soul food restaurant Jaime's or something. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So, um, you've got over 50, yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot of cheap guitars. I, I have more than 50 for sure. Um, but uh, they're mostly tools. You know, I mean, uh, you can see over my shoulder here that the Epiphone Les Paul thing, that was, I think that was $80. My daughter did all the design work on that. And I have it strung up high strung. So it's my... People always like the, the artwork that she did on this. But it, it's, it's really cool. Very, like, uh, Beatles uh, revolver album kind of look. Even says, I love you, Dad, on the back here. I don't know if you can see that. Or it says, I love you. Maybe. Oh, it's Dad on it. But that's really cool. But I, I have it tuned high strong, which means, which means the top four strings are up an octave.
So the, the cluster voicings that you can't get on a regular guitar, you can get on this guitar. Um, so that's why I like that. Yeah, I mean this, you know, like my Dobro, none of those guitars hanging up there, except well, the, the Hofner Beetle Bass, that's an original 60s Beetle Bass. But uh, most of these are very reasonable prices. I, I only paid 500 for that nylon. Now, those are those are like two thousand dollars now. But yeah, I I I, I have a, because I've been a musician. You know, my income <laughs> most of it goes to eating and sleeping. You know, a, a roof over my head. Um, so you know, I don't have you don't have a lot of disposable income as a musician. But sometimes you you you. Uh, Go ahead and do the splurge. So, um, yeah, it's an Epiphone. I think it's an Epiphone special. It's supposed to be like it's got it's got um, uh, the the P90 type pickups in it. No P90 pickups in it, basically single coils. So I only really play it in the middle position because they cancel each other out, so there's less noise. Um, so yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, well, take care, Matt. Good to see you. I feel like I forgot. I started to answer a question. I didn't finish it. Yeah, that was an Epiphone. <laughs> Rewind. <laughs> um, yeah, so you'd be surprised. It, um, if you, if you, like a ukulele with the, the you know, ukulele is tuned. Um, <laughs> here's a, I actually, we played this yesterday. Oh, shoot, I left the. Pickup line, I forgot. <laughs> Never seen one of these. Um, this is a Nagoya harp uh, from Japan. And it's like, this is like something, I don't know why, they, it's like a pre piano kind of thing. Like a lot, they have a million of these things. You can find them all over the place. I got my, I think I got this on Etsy. Um, but I actually used it on a, on a game uh, yesterday. But, but a ukulele. Um, will have the, the bottom string will be tuned up an octave. So if you play like a seven, any seventh chords are going to be cluster, they're going to be like a tight piano voicing, which you can't get on a guitar normally. Um, if I were to play, oh, let's, let's just cut this guitar. You know, if I were to play on a ukulele, if I were just to play like an A7 chord, where, you know, technically you just play like that on a ukulele. Okay, so you'd be, you're here. Ukulele is top four strings here at the fifth fret, uh, but this string is up an octave. So this note is actually this note. So you would end up with this sound. So you, you, you know, it's not playable on the guitar. Um, so, I mean, technically, I guess I could play it like this. Right? But on the piano, that's super duper easy. That cluster, clusters, you create a cluster on a piano when you sit on a piano. <laughs> you sit on a piano or you just put your arm on a piano, that's a cluster. On guitar, that's almost impossible because the strings are tuned in fourths, so you just can't get those. Those seconds and thirds are really hard to get, particularly those seconds. Thirds are not a problem, seconds are a problem. All right, what are we doing here? We, I can't believe we, we, we're at 47 people right now. That's amazing, 48. Appreciate it. And again, any of the super chat money goes to my daughter's wedding. So I've got a wedding I got to pay for <laughs> when you're a dad. I have a daughter. I only have one daughter, fortunately. Um, so let's see. Is Dan Shaver still there? Dan, did you have a question? Oh, let's see. Let's see the head stuff. Oh. Oh, for the, the Gibbs, I'm, I'm assuming for the. All right, let's see. Um, yeah, and I mean, oh, it's 1030. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, Bruce is aware that I've got work to do. <laughs> and people are showing up in a little bit. So I don't know. I'll, I'll get work done when I get work done. I My, my client, I think he realizes, um, I mean, it's it, this is for Apex. Uh, I play all the guitars on Apex Legends. Everybody take a sip. That's one of our drinking game rules if I mention that I play guitar with, on Apex Legends. So I'm working on a new character and um, the new season. 
and we're we're trying to get everything done for the fall season done by July, the mid July. So it makes for kind of a, a cluster of work, so to speak. Um, and then uh, I'm, I'm working on I've been working on Picard a little bit, the TV show Picard. Um, I'm not sure if I, you know, it's just it, it's mostly orchestrated. So. Um, no, I doubt. I doubt Stephen is watching this. <laughs> he's so busy. I don't. Be honest. I don't know when he sleeps. Uh, he actually flew to London for twelve hours to to uh, oversee some music he wrote for the new Star Wars game because he, he's one of the com two composers on Star Wars game, and I think they wrote seventy or I'm sorry, seven hundred minutes of music for that, which is a normal movie. A long movie might have a hundred minutes or hundred twenty minutes of music. Uh, but a game, you know, the game thread, if you play it from start to finish, could be 36, 48 hours. Uh, and so you need, there's music for much of that. So they, he, they recorded everything. They literally rented out Abbey Road Studio One, where they did Lord of the Rings, all the James Bond movies, all the Star Wars movies. Is it Abbey Road Studio One? They rented it for the month with the London Philharmonic to do these, these music for Star Wars. And he, he, he got sick and, and couldn't fly back. And then he flew back when he got better. And, uh, and so he joined the other composer and they did some stuff. But he was literally, he's from London and he, he was only there for 12 hours. So, yeah. So he's, uh, he's an amazing, amazing composer. He's a phenomenal composer. But he's also like, I don't know how he does it all, to be honest. So, and I'm trying to help him out with that. I'm, I'm hoping to kind of get into that little bit of the business I've been doing some writing, so hopefully uh, in that realm. So hopefully, uh, you know, I can transition over to doing some of that. If not, if for no other reason than take some, take some stress off of him and uh, and and do it. But um, yeah, we'll see. If that happens, it happens. So, <laughs> baby bottle, Renee. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, yeah, I have over 800 videos. Well, uh, 200 and. 60 of them are the live stream things, but yeah, I actually, or two, probably close to 300 videos are live stream maybe. Um, but I have videos and they would go way back. You can track, you can track my hair length and color all the way back to, I think the first video is like 2010, 2009, something like that. Um, oh, uh, Russell, you subbed. Okay, great. Um, Dirt, about dirt on an atomic level with a bunch of farmers. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, I love those kind of videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? I know, it's, it's true, I probably should. What's the best music software at the moment? Well, I, I use, oh, thank you, David. What's going on? Good to see you. Um, I use uh, Logic. Um, I started out on Digital Performer, and the reason I used Digital Performer was because all the composers, the few composers that I were working for, they all used um, Digital Performer. So I was, I had seen it, and I thought that was the one to use, and it's still, a lot of people still use it. Um, in fact, most of those composers, they still use it. Uh, Nuendo is a big one. Pro Tools is make, for making records, but I'm telling you, Logic, if you're a Mac user it's it's the in fact i don't have the latest version of logic because my computer can't handle it i've ordered a new computer but it won't be here for a while because you know the, the supply chain issues so um but uh they um logic if you have a mac and you get logic it's 200 dollars and it's loaded loaded with stuff i mean a it's loaded with loops so you can just make songs with loops that they already have in there and they're all you know if you create a song using those loops and you post it you know you might say people it might get like a copyright infringement thing from youtube because so many people use those same loops um however it should be notated as public use or fair use or something i forget but uh but you can also you know it's got synthesizers and piano samples and orchestra and 
base, everything. It's got everything in there. So it's really, Logic for $200 is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, tool. And um, they're not always trying to upsell you. So it's not like there's any other things that you can buy from Apple for Logic. That's it. It's $200. Boom, done. It's not like your typical app like my Madden football where they're always trying to sell you something. <laughs> so, um, and that's also EA, who I'm working for today. So. Um, I'm not disparaging EA. It's, it's a business model, and it works really, really well. But um, but Logic, you buy it, and that's it. So you're golden. Um, the uh, um, it, it takes a, a little while to learn it. At first, when I first got it after using Digital Performer, I called it Illogic because it, it nothing made sense to me. But once you start to figure it out, it's good. GarageBand is fine, too, and that's free. It comes with any Mac. So you could totally use GarageBand, but you know, for two hundred dollars, uh, you know, GarageBand offers about one percent of the uh, features that Logic uses. Maybe, maybe less than one percent, because I always say I use about one percent of what Logic offer has. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't use it to its full potential, and I'm always learning new stuff. I'm learning new shortcuts that oftentimes drive me insane. In fact, I want to do a video on it like my favorite, my top 10 favorite logic shortcuts. And I use it every day. And it's like, I discovered a couple of them that I, I wish I had discovered 10 years ago. I was like, wait, what? Cause I, I would, I work for this composer and he's sending me, he, you know, will send me these guitar parts, but he playing them on piano. So it's like played like a piano and there's all this overlap and all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, oh man. So I'm going through the MIDI and I'm dragging each MIDI note to make them all fit. And I realized there was literally just to my left, there was a button <laughs> that if I hit, it would say interpret. And it was like, oh, it would interpret, interpret it to, to understand it as a chart and make it look like music rather than have all these long notes with ties everywhere or something. It's like, oh my gosh. Okay, Catherine Murphy, did you order a new Mac Studio? Yes, I did. Yeah, the Ultra Studio computers. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the Ultra Studio is. Now I'm curious. Uh, but I did. I uh, but I upgraded it, so I think I get 64 megs of RAM, gigs of RAM, um, and I got the terabyte hard drive. So so I have to wait. The other one, the stock one, you can get at the store. They have the basic one, but the one if you want it upgraded, you're gonna have to wait. So um, yeah, so the studio is gonna be great. I have to buy a monitor. I have a TV monitor I can use. I think for the short term, but I'm ultimately gonna get one of those. Uh, Stephen Barton for the uh, for for Apex. He has one of those curved screens. So I may get one of those for my studio because it's, you know, um, uh, it's, um, I, I could use a lot of real estate, you know, have tuner and a bar counter over here and the click, you know, all that stuff over here and then other stuff, over, you know. Um, so I will have to get a new camera though. So I don't know if I'm going to get a better camera. Hopefully it'll be better because this is 2014 iMac uh, Pro or something, but. Uh, maybe the camera. When I get a camera, I'm going to have to get a specific camera for, uh, for for live streaming. So Andrew Gerard, are you kidding me? Alex and I had a blast at we had a blast at the Magic Castle last Sunday. Not this, not last night, but the night before, the Sunday before. And we were talking about man. We were like, oh, if because you mentioned like, oh, I would love to come down and be with you guys. Uh, if you had done that. I mean, we're going to have to do that. At some point, we're going to have to go with you to the Magic Castle. Uh, I can't even imagine how fun that would be to be at the Magic. We had a blast. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Alex had never been, so for him, it was really, really cool. Um, but Andrew is a world-class everything. <laughs> Hairstylist, magician, uh, uh, you uh, hypnotize, hypnotist. Guitar player, he's a, he's a shredding guitar player, a songwriter, and photography, I think, is your main profession now, if I'm not sure. Have you watched Carton Arcs on YouTube? No. I, uh, Carton Arcs, okay, I'm, I'm pulling it up. I'm going to open up a window, and I have another window I've got to look at, YouTube. Carton Arcs. Okay. <laughs> it just looks. I don't I have no. I have no idea what carton arcs are, but I'm gonna look it up. Uh, everybody else here is looking it up too. So, yeah. Uh, 
gigs around. I actually, and one of my, uh, uh, Stephen uh, is going to help me at some point build a, a PC. So a lot of times, most of the, most of the film composers and the, and the game composers, on the PC, they have all of their, their um, orchestra samples, all their sample libraries. Um, and that way they can have them all up and running. So then they can just click to them on their Mac and they're, and hit the key and it's there. They don't have to wait for it to load because some of these libraries are really big. And they take, even on a fast computer, they take a while to load. And you just don't have time. You need to have it there. So you have the library going. And a lot of times the library is, you know, you're doing string stuff just just so they can the, the director or the producer, whoever, can hear what it's going to kind of sound like when the orchestra does it. And then you send all that MIDI off to a copyist and they create the charts for the orchestra. And then the orchestra, you know, records it live somewhere, Budapest or London at, the, at Abbey Road or whatever. So, um, oh, hey, Mugu's here. Mugu, what's going on? Yep. I didn't say happy Memorial Day. I, I, there, that's not something you would say, I don't think. Um, yes, I would definitely. Oh, uh, somebody's asking about ear training. Yeah, definitely. I still look like I'm 50. What are you talking about? You're the one that has an age. I, I'll be 61 in July. So, uh, oh, TBT, good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I'm I'm here most Mondays. Uh, I tried last Monday. I moved to Tuesday and then Wednesday. It, it, it work's been good, and I'm not complaining. But it, it definitely has to. I have to push because of, of responsibilities, and it, it's kind of where I'm at right now. I got to kind of get to get back to working. I played at the Vogue. Yeah, I played the Vogue um, with Malachi twice, I think. I saw Roadmaster there many times. Ricky and I were, were really good friends back in the day. We saw, we played tennis almost every day when I, when I was in my, you know, like 2021, 20, before I moved to L.A. I missed the guy. He passed away of um, leukemia, I think, just, just three or four years ago. Lifetime smoker, so if you're smoking, please quit. Um, yes. Practicing is a lot like uh, weight working out. Um, I've been, Beth and I have been doing a routine almost trying every day, not quite, but. Did Dan, did you ever play at the Vogue? Is the Vogue still there? I, I'm assuming the Vogue. Oh, Mugu Mugu, you know the walk in, in Broad Ripple? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles now. I, 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 I moved to Los Angeles in 1983. So I've been here. Technically, I was in Pasadena for years and years and years, 35 years. Now um, I've been in, I'm in a, a community in the city of Los Angeles. Oh, Rods and Cones. Oh, my gosh. I remember Rods and Cones. I remember going to see... Um, uh, Duke Tomato and the Ars All Star Frogs. Duke Tomato, they're a Chicago band, and they're still around. Duke Tomato and the All Star Frogs. They actually, <laughs> um, they had the band. You know, they were do they would do like like soul review kind of stuff. You know, R and B, old school R and B. Maybe maybe Beatles. I don't remember that, but it, mostly R and B stuff, old school. And they had a bartender on the stage <laughs> with a bar on the stage just for the band. And the guitar player would play, like, you know, he would play like this, you know, playing up and deliver drinks to the other members of the band. Uh, you know, that was their shtick. Now, of course, it was colored water. <laughs> but it was it was pretty funny shtick. And, um, yeah, they're still around. Oh, should I come up to Ventura? I'm in Ventura every now and then. I like Ventura. I like um, the beach there. The beach isn't bad there. Beth and I will sometimes stay at a hotel on the beach there and just walk around and kind of get our ocean because Ventura, we're in North Valley of L.A., and um, so it's definitely, Ventura's a lot closer than going to Orange County, which is where we used to go all the time. Oh, Duke and Power Trio now. Okay, so it's a smaller, smaller, it's a different, yeah. They drop in at Bob and Tom. So, Dan, you're in, you're in Indianapolis then. Oh, you saw Meatloaf at the Vogue Back before they were big, right? Before they were big or after they were big? Because <laughs> they were big for like five years. They were like huge. He was. He's still huge. Um, yes. 
Uh, Sam, it's true. You hear um, inversions, you're, you will hear a, mi a major triad sometimes, or a major third, sometimes as a minor, because you're hearing the inversion. Inversion means, so from C to E is a major third, but E to C is a minor sixth. The, uh, the inversions are always the opposite. So if it's a major, tri major interval, it's two notes, intervals, two notes, triads are three notes. Intervals are two notes. If it's a major if it's a major interval, then the inversion is minor. And the two numbers should add up to nine. If it's perfect, then the inversion is perfect. So if it's a perfect fifth, like the inversion of a perfect fifth, C to G, G to C is a perfect fourth. But the inversion of a major, a major third, C to E, is a minor sixth, E to C. Um, and so... 3 plus 6 equals 9, right? The inversion of a major second, C to D, D to C, is a, is a minor seventh. So major second is a minor seventh. If I go minor second, so if I go say uh, C, C to C, or C to D flat, okay, that's a minor second. The inversion of that is a major seventh. So a minor second inversion is a major seventh. So you reverse it from major to minor, and you subtract the number from 9, and you get the inversion name. You may not be able to find it on the instrument, but at least you know how to find the name of it. Oh, what? Uh, uh, Meatloaf died? I don't remember that. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I do. Oops. That's a bummer. Oh, yeah, he says singer dies. Yeah. Let's see, Wikipedia page. Yeah, they won't say that on the Wikipedia. Oh, January 2nd, 22. Yeah, weird. No official cause of death. Well, at least his daughters were with him. It's like so many people that... that um, You know, died early of COVID. They didn't. They died alone, which is sad. So, all right, all right. So, what else do we have here? Let's see. Tiny Tim tiptoed through the tulips with his own ukulele. I don't know. I remember when he got married to Vicky, Miss Vic. No, what? Who was it? He got married to Vicky. Somebody. Yeah, the, uh, Russell. You know, I remember. Uh, well, for one thing, I mean, Roadmaster and Faith Band were the big bands when I was a kid. Um, I remember when um, I remember seeing, um, well, Faith Band played at my high school. And I remember um, uh, helping them, showing up at the end because I didn't have a date. I didn't go to the mixer or whatever it was. Um, I showed up afterwards to, to help them tear down. <laughs> I just want to be part of the band, you know. Um, I remember going to the rehearsal studio where that they shared, and I remember when uh, Faith Band was supposed to warm up Kenny Loggins at Ma Market Square Arena, and he uh, and Carl Story, his the the light on their truck or something was sticking out on the front, and he hit it with his hand, and it shattered and cut his hand really bad. And he couldn't play harmonica, um, and I don't know if they canceled the show. It would seem weird if they canceled the show, but maybe they did cancel. It was like their big, it was a big deal. I mean, they, it, they, one of the weirdest things, they had a song called Dancing Shoes that they wrote that, uh, who's the Nils, Nils, not Nils Lofgren, who was the artist that recorded it? And they both had mild hits of the same song at the same time. It was like the weirdest, like who would do that? Who would let someone record their song? Um, watch your language, sorry, Russell. <laughs> We're trying to keep it family. I, I uh, believe it or not, they uh, YouTube goes through the through the uh, chat, and if there's cuss words and stuff like that, that's why they set to approval. Um, then there's certain people that it won't, I won't be able to monetize. So there's certain advertisers that won't advertise. So, um, yeah, open tunings are phenomenal. The great thing about open tunings is you can hit it and it just sounds good, and then you just start messing around and experimenting. That's it's really good. I think open tunings are really good for your brain. I use open tunings a lot or weird tunings. Um, even just like um, 
<clears throat> like I have lots of cheap squires and I keep them in weird tunings like this one because it inspires me to write things I wouldn't normally write. This one only has three strings on it and they're all E. So I have a, I think those are E's, yeah. So, so I'm like, okay, well, what do you do with that? And of course this rattles, but um, let's see if I can get a sound out of this. Do I have a sound? Uh, yeah, maybe something like this. You're like, well, for one thing, it's very buzzy. I probably paid $79 for this one. But I'll use it. I mean, the ETA song I did with Justin Bieber, I mean, I've written you know, like 40 songs with Justin, but um, ETA, which was on Changes, that's my $99 square right there, the black square behind the camera. Um, I use it all the time. I keep nines on it because it just sounds nasty and funky and lo-fi and I love that you know uh, I don't need to have an expensive guitar to make music so uh, I, I and I I say that as an encouragement you know a lot of people I, I have viewers in Africa and in uh, India and and such that they cannot <laughs> um Oh yeah, you're fine. You didn't. Have, I, I I didn't approve it there, Russell. Don't worry about it. But yeah, I, I knew what you meant. <laughs> Trust me. I yeah. Imagine if that happened to me. Um, I broke a nail the other day, and I was up yesterday, and I was upset. I was like, gosh darn, because uh, I'm blind in one eye. I have no depth perception, so I reached for something, and I bent this nail back, and it and it broke so bad that I was like, oh no, I had to file it all off. So, um, so I got three E's. Okay, well, what can I do with three E's? Well, so there's. Three A, B. So there's one, four, five. There's six. But I could just take. I could just do something like that with a drony kind of E thing. But what I like to do is like. I can add that second, get the third in there. some really cool sounds out of it voicings that I would never in a million years use do on a normally tuned guitar not to mention the fact that I could I can strum the heck out of it it's distorting a little bit but uh, I can strum the heck out of it and not have a lot of extra strings ringing out the intonation is good enough uh, for pop anyway. But anyway, so that, that's, you know, one of the things, uh, not just open tunings, but just weird tunings that you would think you would never use. So I'm giving away the secrets here. I'm giving away the secrets. I need to go. I hate to go because we, I'm like, how many people do we have on right now? This is crazy. Well, we, we've dropped down, but we were, we peaked out at like 49. I can't believe it. You know, that's like, that's like almost COVID days. Yeah, I could play Goo Goo Dolls. You're totally right. That's a total Goo Goo Dolls kind of sound, isn't it? Uh, oh, St Staley Explorers. Let's see. What has been the one thing you feel you've learned the most important for you in your musical career up to this point? Thank you for your stream today. Whew, what's the, That's a great question. Um, what's the one thing? I would say collaborate. Collaborating is because collaborating can help you on so many levels. Collaborating can also be interpreted playing with others, like playing in bands. Um, when you play in a band, man, you get better fast because you got to practice. You know, you're not going to show up at band rehearsal not knowing your parts. I mean, you could, but you're not going to. They're not going to want you around if you do. Um, and you're also afraid of making a fool of yourself. And so you're going to, you know, you want to be the best you can be. Um, so I would say that's part of collaboration. But the bigger part of collaboration. Because the key there was musical career. The key word for me there was career. Music, being a musician is not necessarily having a career. You can be, a, if I know of some great musicians that don't play professionally, uh, don't make any money as a guitar player or a musician, um, but they're phenomenal musicians. 
they did the work and that's a different question so that's why I say collaborating because I didn't start making real money until I started working with others and I always say this um, you know when we were and maybe I don't know I'm old enough that we didn't really have this in health class but like kids you know they'll learn in health class back in the day that you know when you have sex with someone you're having sex with everyone they've ever had sex with you know they're trying to scare you which <laughs> kind of is not wrong right but it's kind of the same thing with songwriting okay so let's say if Andrew's still here I don't think Andrew, I don't know Andrew are you still here but let's say Andrew and I write a song together which we have actually I think we've written songs together right Andrew or have we only have I only played on your songs have we not collaborated I can't remember but let's say Andrew and I write a song okay and Andrew right so Andrew and I have this song together over here this pink my pinky on my left hand is the song that Andrew and I wrote together and he wrote 10 songs with 10 different people. Okay, these are all like different collaborations that he did. He's got 10 songs and they're all with 10 different people. And this song way over here got on a record and it was a smash. And so a Andrew gets a publishing deal and the publisher says, what other songs do you have? And he goes, well, I have these 10 songs. And he puts the 10 songs on the table and they go, yeah, no, 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 we don't really like, no. Oh, we like this song. Let's put this song on a record. So now, because of your association with this person over here who you didn't even know, you know, it's kind of that six degrees of separation thing, because they had a publisher, and they got a song on a record, or they had a, a connection, and they got a song on a record with a friend, and then that person got, you know, it's, I noticed what, what started happening in the mid-2000s for me was, and I'm in L.A., um, and I've been in L.A. at that point for 20, 20 plus years. I moved here in 83, so mid 2000s, it, it had been 22 years. Um, people that um, I, friends of mine, started getting hit by, I call it career lightning. Um, and they, oh, do you hear what happened? Oh, so and so is now here, and so and so is here, and boom, 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 doing this, and whatever. And it was just a matter of time, if you stay in the game, that eventually that lightning, as long as you're doing your work, um, and I remember, you know, like with Kook, Kook is the one that introduced me to Justin Bieber and brought me into that camp. And I remember doing $50 sessions for Kook where I'd spend an afternoon with him, you know, and him yelling at me to try to get the sound that he wanted uh, because he wished he could hire Michael Thompson, but he couldn't afford Michael Thompson. I was like the poor man's poor man's Michael Thompson. Um, and, uh, you know, he would get out of me. He trained me by like directing me to the sound. No, that's not the sound, dude. No, play it more like this, you know, and like, oh, okay. And I kind of figured it out. And, and you know, he brought me along with him, you know, and, and other people have brought me along. Or I had a friend that was was uh, running, uh, mixing the NFL network. And I said, hey, we should write songs for the NFL network. And so we got into the habit of every week getting together and writing two or three rock songs. And he would mix them and make them sound like record. He played drums and I played guitar and bass and write the songs. And, and we started to get in the habit of every day, every week writing a, a song or two for, for the NFL Network. Never got on the NFL Network, but we got them in other places and eventually got you know a, a gig writing music for, for Let's Make a Deal. And that paid a lot of money. And that, again, was a collaborative kind of thing. I could never have gotten that by myself, but between the two of us, we got it together. He couldn't have done anything without me, and I couldn't have done anything without him. So it was, um, yeah, networking is definitely, um, I think, one of the keys and um you know finding your role i think that's the other thing is you know you may see yourself here i, I think about like la reed um the the record label executive now but before he was a record label executive he was a record before he was a record label president he was a uh, head of a and r before he was head of a and r he was a Grammy winning record producer before that he was a songwriter before you know and, and before that he was managing bands in Cincinnati um, and before that he was a wannabe drummer that couldn't do it you know he couldn't he, he he it's see in my opinion it's even though your passion may be guitar it's much more fun to be successful producing records than unsuccessful playing guitar or it's more, you know, in other words, he found that he could help his band, you know, his friends' bands make money. And that was, and he made money that way, and he couldn't make money playing drums because he wasn't very good. And um, so he, he 
transitioned his career more into the business side of things. Record writing, song writing with Babyface. The two of them wrote millions of hits and, and produced millions of hits. And he just kept transitioning. It's like David Foster did the same thing. He kept transitioning. Now, David Foster could have made a career at any level that he was at and stayed there. But he kept, you know, he just kept moving up. I use both of them as examples of that kind of looking. And the same thing with me. I'm not, you know, I've done, I think at one point I counted 37 different jobs in the music business. Everything from working at a record store to making records. Everything from teaching private lessons to teaching clinics and teaching at USC. Um, I, I've... Um, you know, I've done, um, you know, I've done charts, you know, uh, you know, uh, copy work for ch making charts. So, you see, you know, you can, the key for me was just, I wanted to stay in the game and, and then just through all those contacts, eventually stuff started to show up. And my good main goal was to, when I moved to LA was to do session work. And that's a large portion of my income. I still make more money, I think, with my writing for TV and, and, Pop artists and things like that. Ultimately, it's probably like 60 40, you know, 60% uh, mailbox, you know, money, money I've generated by writing and money. And then 40% is like I make, you know, 6 million a year is from, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> 6 million a year is from songwriting and 4 million a year is from gigs and sessions. <laughs> so I'm not making 10 million a year. All right, it's been two hours and three minutes. Thank you, Bruce. I should get going. Uh, Alex will be here in a minute. I'm, I'm going to do some work. I did some work this morning. I'm going to do some more right now. What was it? I, I, oh, I was trying to find a I want to. I want to play this. This is on piano. It's kind of like a rock on and off piano thing, but I'm going to double it on guitar. I'm not going to. I may play it. In, it's written in octaves. I may play it in octaves. Not in octaves. I may play both octaves. I may play down low and up high. But that's my next thing. I was just on the hunt for a good guitar tone that I wanted to use for that. That actually takes me the longest not playing i can play this in one take that's about right there is about 25 seconds of music so i can play that in 25 seconds the hard part is finding the guitar tone so uh guitar shocker good to see you what's the cheapest way i can play live in my live streams um it shouldn't cost anything you could just open up your browser and create a, a youtube account and then just sit there and the, it should act, ask if you have a camera on your laptop or on your, you can use your phone, I think. Um, but you, and you can live, I've live streamed on TikTok. Uh, nobody showed up, but I was there in case anybody did. Uh, I'm buying. Yeah, I'm buying. <laughs> Drinks on me, Rob. <laughs> I mean, it takes me a second. I'm like, wait, context. What did Rob say? What, what am I buying? <laughs> uh, you're at, uh, my avatar. Oh, that's a seagull. That's 12. Yeah. I, that's how I know you. Sam, if you ever changed your avatar, I wouldn't recognize you. Thank you, Charlie B. Good to see you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, you want a good sound. Yeah, I don't have that. <laughs> so, um, Guitar Shocker, that's a great... I would ask that, like... Uh, uh, Rhett, um, even, you know, I don't know if Rick uh, Beato has done, he has an okay sound. There's a way to, I can have an input. So you can get OBS software. OBS software is free. So you can get that. I have, that's what I'm using right now. And what that allows me to do is have multiple like screens. Like I can go back and through previous lessons and things like that. Um, so that's what I use it for. But you can also have multiple inputs. I can add, um, I can add input sources. I've got a button here, audio input capture, audio output capture, browser. I can insert a browser in there, color source, all sorts of things, okay? So OBS software is free for PC or Mac, PC I'm sure, I'm assuming it is. Um, and so you, it takes a minute to learn. It's a little awkward. I think it's a PC software primarily, so that's why it doesn't feel right to me. Um, but you can take that and um, you can input your guitar sound. So if you're getting really good sounds, I, what you're hearing is the speakers going into my stupid microphone. On I'm not using this microphone. Yeah. Nothing there. So I'm not using a, a microphone. Some people will have like a SM7, which is a very common mic. I think they're about 350 or so, 400 bucks. Um, in fact, I can pull one up on Amazon so that you can, um, if you decide to buy an SM7, buy it from this link and then I get 5% of the sale. Um, sure. 
Yeah, SN7B. Boy, I that, that came up right away. Except it corrected the word. Oh, do not. I hate article. Okay. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Here's an arm. Boom, boom. Yeah, 400 bucks. Yeah, and there's other ones, but I, this is the one. I've been meaning to get one of these. I may get one at some point. Maybe with my new set up my new computer, I'll get one of these, because it's a good mic to have anyway. It's good for vocals. Um, I think Kook used it on Alex's band with the singer because she it was like kind of a rock thing. So it's a good rock vocal mic. It's basically an S, it's like a high quality uh, 58. You know, it's a it's slightly different. It's good on guitar amps. I've used them on guitar amps. So there's the Amazon link. So if you, if you want to buy one, if you want to upgrade that, I'm going to get one at some point, so I may order it from that same link but um that's not a bad way to go <laughs> sorry bruce i'm trying to get off here but uh oh jamming uh yeah we joni we've kind of done um a couple and i haven't done one in a while but we, we've done a couple zoom things and in zoom context you can kind of do that but there's still latency this latency would be way too much i don't even know how you do it on youtube um there may be <laughs> you know, I know I've seen people do live streams where they have two people on there and they're two different locations. So there's a way to do it. Oh, Michael, you're still here. Thank you so much. Um, Peroni showed up. Look at that. Um, yeah, I mean, you never know who, you, you know, collaborating. Hey, if you can find a collaborative person here, you know, what you want to do in a collaboration is find something that somebody that does something that you don't do. So, for example... Pooh Bear is great at top lines, okay? And I've discovered something about myself. Um, I'm a really good starter, but a lousy finisher, all right? So a song is a perfect example of that. I can come up with a great hook idea, but as I can't write the top line and stuff. I'm not going to write a modern one. Top line is lyrics and melody. So I will get it. That's why Justin's really good at that. So I'll send him, like he wrote, like we did Yellow Raincoat. We wrote that together in the studio. <laughs> He goes, can I write over it? And I said, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> and he's like, really? I'm like, I forget, you know. I always forget that he, he thinks of me as an adult. Like, I'm not joking around like he does. And so, uh, yeah, I know Bruce. <laughs> 210. Um, and so, uh, uh, so yeah, I you want to collaborate with someone who does something that you don't do. Like having two bottom line, you know, two bed writers chord writers it doesn't make any sense you need you need to work with somebody who does something that you don't do um so a lot of times i'll work with a top line person and a producer who makes it tracks and maybe someone's created beat that's why you see so many names on a, rec a pop record especially now because everybody's doing a different job and everybody's good at, at something but not at good at everything um and if i tried to do everything it would be a, a pretty cheesy pop song all right all right so uh Oh, dang. Well, you may have had the COVID. Who knows, Joseph? It, it pe People have been getting it's Every every strain is different. Um, oh, headache, sneezing, no appetite, stomach pain, body pain. Yeah, that sounds like the flu. Sneezing, maybe really bad hay fever, but did you lose your sense of taste and smell? <laughs> yes, mom, <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> anyway, okay. Well, a really good turnout today. Thanks for the super chat money, people. That's all going to the wedding. So uh, we're going to try to get that thing paid for. <laughs> I don't think you guys are going to do it, but you're helping. I'll, I'll give you that. It all helps. So um, I will I will see you next Monday. Hopefully I can do a, a song uh, Monday. I, it's we're, Our next one's going to be an acoustic song. And we've done 16 so far. You know, last week was Day Tripper. The week before that was Jack and Diane. That one's really popular. Um, with Sunshine of Your Love by Cream. I'm trying to pick pretty darn easy songs. 
I, the way I taught guitar lessons was always trying to, every lesson had to teach you a new skill of some kind. So I'm trying to make sure that whatever, and then I'm also digging a little bit into the theory, going a little deeper into the song that I'm, than I might if I was doing a half hour lesson. Um, so that kind of thing, you know, maybe why they wrote that or how they wrote it or what, come up with that. I talk about that if I can. Uh, the theory behind it, maybe sometimes the scales used or things like that. Um, and uh, gear, maybe sometimes, you know, I'm not I'm super knowledgeable on that stuff, but um, had no hunger. Yeah. Mm. Just sip water. Dang, that sounds bad. <laughs> Money pox. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it could be all of those. Who knows? You had them both. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think I had COVID, but I'm not sure. I think I had it back before it was shut. We were shut down. Um, and now we're finding out it was around like in 19, 2019 people had it. So um, I don't know. At the NAM show, everybody got sick after the NAM show, which was in Anaheim in January of 2020. And everybody's sharing guitars and keyboards and it's packed together and eating together. It's just like this. If, so, if you've ever, that's like the classic super spread of, spreader event i mean it had all the markings of that so and there was literally probably one quarter of the attendees were from china so um it's a big convention for the music business so anyway i'm gonna sign out thanks bruce for keeping tabs on it i'm gonna sign out and i'm gonna maybe try to do some work until Alex shows up and then i'll hang out and do some festivities for the uh for the for the for the celebrating memorial day but being with family God bless you guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I will hopefully see you. Uh, oh, hey, Wise and Danger. Um, I did play on Marco. So I played on a couple Marco records. Um, yeah, indeed. So, um, money, <laughs> your money box. Dum ba da dum ba 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 money box. All right, I, I got to stop. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. I appreciate the numbers. The numbers are great. Really good numbers for that. It must be the holiday. Everybody's home from work. So, all right. Take